Welcome to Intro to Unaccompanied Children and Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, hosted by the American Bar Association Children's Immigration Law Academy, or CELA. My name is Dahlia Castillo Granados, and I am the director at CELA. With me on this webinar are my co panelists, Natasha Reyes Diaz and Judge Kathleen Anderson. Natasha is a managing attorney in the Unaccompanied Minors Program at the Diocesan Migrant and Refugee Services, or DMRS. Natasha graduated from the University of Puerto Rico Law School and practiced law in Puerto Rico before moving to El Paso in 2014. Judge Anderson is a graduate of the University School of Law and was most recently the Associate Judge of County Court at Law No. 5 in El Paso. She has a wealth of experience in family law and is a frequent speaker on family law issues. We also have on the webinar, Linda Rivas. She is the Children's Program Director at DMRS and will help us with the Q&A. Today's presentation will cover an overview of the process for children who cross the border on their own without a parent or legal guardian and are designated unaccompanied. The presentation will also cover the most common form of humanitarian relief for immigrant youth, special immigrant juvenile status. There are a few housekeeping items and reminders I'd like to cover before we get started. This training is an hour and a half long. Please use the Q&A function rather than the chat box to enter questions so we can address questions throughout the presentation and at the end. We have reserved time for questions at the end. This training is being recorded. CELA will post the training recording on our website following the training. This course has been approved for 1.5 hours of Texas CLE credit, including 0.25 credit hours of ethics. We will provide a survey for feedback and a survey for CLE where you can request Texas CLE credit for attending. If you are licensed outside of Texas, please also complete this survey and we will provide a letter of attendance that can be submitted to your state bar to request CLE credit. Following the training, we will provide a PDF of the slides. In that email, we will also include the survey links once again. CELA is a project of the American Bar Association. We are part of the Commission on Immigration. CELA is a legal resource center and we aim to build the capacity of legal service organizations and pro bono attorneys to represent children facing deportation. There is no right to appointed counsel in immigration court, even for children. And we believe that every child should have an attorney at their side in their immigration proceedings. CELA provides individualized technical assistance which can be requested by any attorney representing a child or youth in their immigration case. We also offer regular trainings, resources, and the opportunity to collaborate with other attorneys and legal staff through working groups. We support pro bono programs through a pro bono initiatives project, which includes a pro bono platform, pro bono matters for children facing deportation. Recently, we started a social work program to support social workers and social services staff working at the legal service organizations in Texas, and we are now in the process of expanding that service nationwide. We offer free legal service free resources on our website, cilacademy.org, including a detailed pro bono guide that goes over how to work with children and youth in their immigration case. So now we'll start with our presentation, including the definition of an unaccompanied child. This is the legal definition of an unaccompanied child, and it is a child who enters the US without a valid entry document and who is not accompanied by a parent or legal guardian. Children leave their uh, country of birth for many reasons, and their reasons can often be multifaceted. This chart comes from a UNHCR report that documents the journey of 404 unaccompanied children. All those circles inside show intersecting reasons for migrating. The root causes can be 
include targeted violence um, because of a child's ethnicity or religion, sexual orientation, political opinion, or because they refuse to be part of a gang. It could also be because they are suffering violence by a parent or a caretaker. Every child has a unique story and it's really important to discuss these matters in details. And it's also important to keep in mind that a child might express one reason uh, for coming to the US when you first talk to them, which could be because they want to reunite with family or for more opportunities. But as you talk to them and build rapport with them, then there might be, they might share other reasons. For example, that they were being recruited or threatened or hurt by a gang member or a family member. Here is a um, information or data that comes from Health and Human Services about the country of origin uh, of children that are entering the country unaccompanied. You'll see here that the data has changed over the years, uh, the percentage of children coming from each country. The most recent data here shows that in fiscal year 2022, 29% of children um, that entered the US unaccompanied came from Honduras, 47% from Guatemala, which is an increase that has been going on for uh, many years now, um, from El Salvador at 13%, uh, from Mexico 3%, and from all other countries 8%. There's also data that comes from Customs and Border Protection, and this data is published monthly. It shows uh, the amount of unaccompanied children that are coming across the border, and the most recent data comes from March of this year. Each of the lines on this chart represent a different fiscal year, and the most recent fiscal year of 2023 are in the dark blue line. Um, you can see here that a little over 12,000 children um, entered unaccompanied in the month of March. There are specific laws um, for children that enter unaccompanied. Uh, we'll start, um, and policies as well, and we'll start with the Flores Settlement Agreement, um, which this is a lawsuit that was in response to the conditions of detention of children in the early 1980s. Um, they were subject um, to, you know, terrible conditions, including being held with adults, uh, being subject to cavity searches, uh, not being allowed to leave uh, the shelter unless a parent uh, came to claim them. Um, and so this lawsuit uh, came about because of those conditions. This case actually went up all the way to the Supreme Court and then back down through the federal courts. And there was a settlement agreement that was finally signed in 1997. And what this settlement agreement does is it guarantees um, that children should be in the least restrictive setting, which means that they should not remain in detention if at all possible and instead should be allowed to um, go to a family member that is in the community. It also requires that um, the facilities where children are held um, be state licensed. There was some additional protections that came about from the Homeland Security Act of 2002, which abolished the Immigration and Naturalization Service or INS and instead created the Department of Homeland Security and the immigration agencies um, are now housed under DHS. Um, it also transferred the care of children from INS, uh, which was an enforcement um, you know, branch of, um, of immigration um, and also handled other aspects of immigration and it moved it to health and human services. This is also where you can find the definition um, of an unaccompanied child and it also created the child's advocate program. In 2008, um, there was some expansion of protections for unaccompanied children through the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act or the TVPRA of 2008. It guarantees that children should be placed in removal proceedings, which is actually a benefit because it guarantees that children will not be processed through expedited removal. Um, it expands protections for children that are subject to parental mistreatment. And we'll talk more about that when we get to special migrant juvenile status. And importantly, it provides a child an opportunity to present their asylum case in a non-adversarial setting, even if they have, um, even if they're in removal proceedings, um, they would first have a chance to present their case before the asylum office. 
So there are many agencies that are involved in the processing of unaccompanied children at the border. Um, we talked about DHS and there's three agencies, three immigration agencies within DHS that handle immigration issues, uh, Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and US Citizenship and Immigration Services, each handling a different part of um, immigration services. Um, CBP are um, the agents that are most likely to have apprehend a child at the border. Um, if you've ever seen um, pictures of children in um, under mylar blankets um, in, in these holding facilities, um, those are most likely CBP holding facilities and children should be uh, transferred to the care of Health and Human Services within 72 hours from those holding facilities. Um, they are transferred within to an agency uh, within HHS called the Office of Refugee Resettlement where that houses um, unaccompanied children through a network of shelters. Um, and one other thing that CBP agents do is that they will interview a child and get some information that is used to create the charging document called a notice to appear, which is uh, then filed with the immigration court, uh, which is under the Executive Office for Immigration Review um, within the Department of Justice. And that's how removal proceedings are started. There are shelters um, all over the US. Um, I included some links here in the slide, which shows that there are about 200 state licensed facilities and programs in 22 states that are funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, here are some recent um, data and numbers. Um, as of about a week ago, there was 7,380 children um, in um, HHS care. The average length of stay for an unaccompanied child in shelter is about 25 days. So the vast majority of children are released to somebody in the community within that time frame. In fiscal year 2022, there was about um, uh, approximately 72% of the children that were referred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement were over 14 years of age and 64% were boys. And here in this chart is a further breakdown of the age of children um, that go through the ORR system. Once a child is transferred from that CBP holding facility to an ORR shelter, um, an ORR caseworker will begin some assessments, including taking biographic information, um, going through a medical screening and potentially a mental health evaluation. Um, then a legal service provider such as DMRS um, that is uh, assigned to the different shelters will go to the shelter and provide the child with a Know Your Rights presentation and a legal screening. The ORR caseworker is then tasked with identifying a sponsor and completing reunification as soon as practicable. Um, and we see in the statistics that that is about 25 days right now. Um, there's different categories of sponsors. Um, so, you know, in order of preference, children should be released to their parents or legal guardians. If not, then to a close family member. Um, if there is um, not a close family member, then they could also be released um, to a distant family member or a family friend. And if that's not an option, then the child may be able to go to a long-term um, a shelter facility, a long-term uh, foster care facility, um, or they could seek voluntary departure or take an order of removal. There are also some children that age out of care um, if they turn 18, um, and they will most likely be released um, into the community rather than being transferred to an ICE detention facility. Once the child is in the community, then hopefully they will be referred to a nonprofit organization that's able to provide pro bono representation. I mentioned that uh, the CBP agents will take information from the child to create something called a notice to appear, which is the charging document that starts removal proceedings. Um, the child can at that time either contest the charges on the notice to appear, uh, which is very rare, or claim relief from deportation. So as I mentioned, there is no right to appointed counsel, even for children, and there's very few child-friendly court procedures in the immigration court. 
The immigration's job is to adjudicate an application for relief. They can either grant or deny that application, um, give the child a voluntary departure if they qualify or order the child removed. So there's very few um, options um, if a child cannot claim um, to, to file for relief. Um, so it's really important to assess the case and see whether or not the child qualifies for one of the humanitarian based um, relief options, including special immigrant juvenile status, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, a child could also qualify for asylum if they fear persecution on one of the five protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or because they're a member of a particular social group. They could also qualify for a U visa if they suffered, um, if they were the victim of a crime and helped um, law, the law enforcement agency um, with the investigation or prosecution of that crime. They could also be eligible for a T visa if they were the victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons, or they might qualify for VAWA if they're the spouse or child of a US citizen or lawful permanent resident and have suffered domestic violence. There's also ethical considerations to keep in mind when representing children. Um, the Texas Rules of Professional Conduct have a, um, a specific rule for clients that may have a diminished capacity. Um, the rule states that a lawyer shall, as far as reasonably possible, maintain a normal client-lawyer relationship with the client. And um, the notes to the rule also have some additional helpful information. It's also important for the lawyer to uh, do um, to follow the stated interest of the child um, rather than um, what the, the lawyer might believe is in the child's best interest. And I wanted to point to one resource, the ABA standards for legal representation of unaccompanied children, um, which you know um, is helpful in, in representing children and, and makes it clear um, that a lawyer should follow the child's express wishes. Um, also, I wanted to everyone to keep in mind that Texas is a mandatory reporting state. Um, this is the statute from the family code. And if a professional, including a lawyer, has reasonable cause to believe that a child has been abused or neglected or may be abused or neglected, then they have to make a report. That report um, goes to CPS um, so they can have an opportunity to investigate. At CELA, we created a video featuring immigrant youth um, in their own voice. Uh, the video is called Escuche Mi Voz, or Listen to My Voice. Um, and the, um, the PowerPoint slides will include um, the link to the video, and I encourage you um, to take a look um, so you can hear straight from um, children that went through the ORR system. Now we're turning over to special immigrant juvenile status. And we have a hypo here um, of a case um, from a client named Yesenia. Uh, she traveled from Honduras um, after she was unable to continue living with her grandmother. Um, she was designated an unaccompanied child when she entered the US um, and she was sent to an ORR shelter in El Paso. She was um, released to her mother who lives in Texas. Um, and refer to a local legal service provider who is now trying to find a pro bono attorney for Yesenia and she has an upcoming um, court hearing. So special migrant juvenile status is uh, the most common form of relief for unaccompanied children, although it does not have to be an unaccompanied, ch uh, an unaccompanied child um, in order to qualify for special migrant juvenile status that is important to keep in mind. Uh, this is a form of humanitarian-based immigration relief for non-citizen children in the U.S. who have suffered parental mistreatment. It could be a child in the state's foster care system, um, you know, that can qualify for SIJS. Um, Texas CPS does a good job of screening for um, for children that may be eligible for SIJS. Um, it could be children in the care of ORR. Um, and my understanding is DMRS um, does, uh, you know, handles cases for children that are in ORR shelters. Um, it could be a child that's living with a non-parent caretaker, or it could be a child that's living with one parent if the other parent abused, abandoned, or neglected. Once a child obtains SIJ status, then they can seek a lawful permanent 
seek their lawful permanent residence or their green card once it's their turn in the queue. There's only a certain amount of immigrant visas available each year for SIJs in order to become um, lawful permanent residents. Um, and so they must wait their turn in line before they can get their green card. The SIJ statute is at 8 USC 1101-A27J. It defines who is going to be considered a special immigrant juvenile. And it also has something called the consent requirement, um, which basically means that DHS has to, um, has to evaluate a case to make sure that it is bona fide and that the child is not just seeking um, relief for an immigration benefit. Um, it also makes clear that there is no immigration benefit that can flow to the parents from the child's status as a special immigrant juvenile. There are regulations um, which um, they, was created by the agency on how they're going to adjudicate special immigrant juvenile um, petitions and adjustment of status applications. Um, these were recently updated last year, and it includes some um, helpful definitions, for example, what is considered a juvenile court, the eligibility requirements, and the process for seeking special immigrant juvenile status. It also has some automatic revocation provisions. So, you know, if a child has SIJ status, um, there still could be ways that they lose their status. For example, if they reunify with the parent, um, that previously a court order said they could not reunify with, um, then they might be subject to automatic revocation. There's also one more resource that I wanted to point out. That's the USCIS policy manual on um, SIJS, uh, which is on the USCIS website. The eligibility requirements are that the child has to be physically present in the US at the time of filing and through adjudication of the petition. The child has to be unmarried, and that's at the time of filing and through adjudication of the SIJS petition. This is a really important change that came about with the updated regulations. So it's no longer required that the child remain unmarried um, until they get their green card, just through um, getting approval of the petition, um, which is a significant and important change now that there is a, a backlog uh, for children waiting to get their green card. The child has to be under 21 at the time that they file their petition. Um, they have to have a valid juvenile court order with some specific findings or determinations. And they also have to ensure that they get DHS consent, which again is um, verifying that the request is, is bona fide and not just for an immigration benefit. The first step in an SIJ case is to obtain that state court order. And um, in order to qualify, the order to qualify for SIJ, um, the order must be valid. It must have a judicial determination about custody or dependency, parental reunification, and best interest. And the order also has to warrant consent. So in order to be considered valid by USCIS, the order has to be issued under state law, and the child must remain under the continuing jurisdiction of the court. So um, the, it's important not to cite to any immigration statute or regulation and the state court pleadings and ensure that all arguments are made under state law. And the continuing jurisdiction provision um, is a requirement, as I mentioned, but there are some important exceptions. If the child is adopted or placed in a permanent guardianship, or if the order is terminated based on age, then those are two enumerated exceptions um, to this requirement. As I mentioned, the first judicial determination is custody or dependency. Um, so it's either or, um, the, the order can um, uh, determine the custody if the child, if it, it is, if there's a dependency determination, there's some additional requirements. Um, the USCIS requires that there be some sort of state court intervention um, when making a dependency determination. The second judicial determination on parental reunification, I'd like to think of in three parts. First of all, the child must have suffered abuse, neglect, or abandonment. It had to have been by a parent, and that is what is making reunification not possible. Um, so that determination must be included in the state court order. 
And then the third judicial determination is on best interest and might be the um, the finding that uh, juvenile court judges uh, might find um, you know, the most confusing. Um, and really the judge is only making an individualized assessment and considering factors that it would normally take into account when making a best interest determination. So um, the judge should be weighing the different options, what, who are the available caretakers in the home country, uh, whether the child is safe, has access to services and deciding what is the best placement option for the child. Um, the specific language from the statute says that um, it, the, chat, the order must find that it would not be in the child's best interest to return to their home country. And then finally, um, there's some guidelines about what, um, how the order can ensure that they will warrant consent. It has to include a factual basis. So USCIS wants to know who the child was placed with and why that determination was made, what ground applies to what parent. So is it abuse, abandonment, neglect? Uh, was it mother or the father? Um, um, that mistreated the child and then also what uh, went into making the determination about best interest. Um, I also mentioned that um, the if you have a dependency determination that it, that it requires some additional um, relief or it requires that there be some relief from parental abuse, uh, neglect or abandonment. And that also is here in the consent requirement. And now uh, I'm happy to turn it over to my co-panelist, Natasha. Thank you, Dalia. So I'm going to be talking about El Paso local practice for um, the siege cases, um, but particularly what we do in state court. Um, in El Paso, we have three different courts, which here SAPSAR, and SAPSAR stands for the suit affecting parent-child relationship. Um, we have county court at law five, um, presiding honorable um, judge Jesus Rodriguez, and the Associate uh, Honorable Judge Karen Pelletier. We also have the 383rd District Court, presiding Honorable Lydia Nes Garcia, and the Associate Court is the Honorable Patrick Bramblett. We have the 388th District Court, presiding the Honorable Judge um, Marlene Gonzalez, and the Associate Judge for that court is the Honorable James D. Lucas. Um, it's important to know that cases can be heard by either the presiding or the associate judge. Um, and it's important and a recommendation um, that we give is for you to check online the court policies, procedures, and rules of each court because each court has their own rules. Um, and especially on the 388 district court, I know that it's going to vary who is the judge assigned to the case by the cost number, if it's um, odd or a pair number. So another or more, more general tips, um, temporary orders are valid before USCIS. So if for any reason you are not um, able to get a final order, you can um, seek a temporary order. Just um, ensure that the order state that will be in effect until the child uh, the child turns 18. Um, here in Texas, um, we have until the child turns 18 to get the state court order signed. Um, be nice to court staff. Um, we are lucky here in El Paso because sometimes we hear things about other um, Texas cities, um, state courts, and um, we are grateful um, and we appreciate um, the court staff that we have here in El Paso State Court. Um, sometimes um, we have to, uh, or we want the, the judge or the court staff to accommodate um, our cases and our needs because it's, it's an emergency. So take that into consideration when you decide if you are going to file a case or litigate a case or not. Um, especially um, if it's a service um, via publication, 
And if you have doubts and you don't know how to proceed or what you should do, if it could be by submission, if the judge wants um, to have the a testimony, then you can always call court staff. Um, and thank you for the court staff that is um, attending this uh, CLE. So local practice corresponding with the courts um, here in El Paso. Um, if you are going to send an email, send a request, you can um, get those email addresses online um, and always have on um, hand your cost number and the request. What are you requesting on, on that email? Um, all the documents should be saved um, and sent as PDF. Um, for you to file a SAPSA or the original petition um, in suit affecting parent and child relationship, um, you have to do that online, but all the documents have to be saved uh, as PDF. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the documents that you will need um, to initiate the case. Um, here we um, use the statement of inability to pay because um, these children come with nothing. Um, they are detained under federal custody or on their office of the refugees resettlement and they have no income and they are not covering their expenses is um, ORR. So they have, um, they can't afford paying the fees to initiate the case. Um, also the case screening instrument um, and that is um, required to file by in, with any initial pleading in family courts. And it's going to specify the type of proceedings, if you need an interpreter, um, et cetera. We also need the civil case information sheet, and that contains contact information of the person completed the, the form, um, who are the parties, um, what case of, um, what type of case. And finally, and the most important is the original petition in suit affecting the parent-child relationship or what we call just the petition. And this petition must include all the facts that might constitute abuse, neglect, and or abandonment applying Texas law. It is important to remember that the law that should apply in these cases is Texas law. Even when there are cultural differences um, that might seem acceptable in, in those countries, they are not when Texas law is applied. And these facts definitely constitute abuse, neglect, or abandonment. Um, we give this example that here in Texas, we are not going to send our child or, or our children to travel by themselves with no provisions at all, let's say to Disney World or to Disneyland, because that will make them happy and we can go. Um, so have that into consideration when you are stating the facts, that journey is an important part of the facts that constitute neglect, um, abuse or even abandonment. Um, for the documents, all the documents must be checked as they contain sensitive data because we are including information um, regarding a child. Um, and also take into consideration that you need like a response from the respondent. It could be the waivers or if they are going to appear, they usually uh, do not appear. So uh, obtaining that waiver sign can take time because sometimes there's not a notary um, close to them. They don't have the money to pay for it and it's pretty expensive to pay a notary in those countries. Um, and if you are like under a time crutch, let the court know. Um, I usually beg, <laughs> uh, but take again, um, consider that our emergencies are not court emergencies. So take that um, in mind when you are filing a case and working um, in a SAPSAR case.
So to request a final hearing, um, there is a form and you have to be ready with the proposed order or the order that you want the judge to sign in case um, the judge is going to sign the order. And it's the order that is going to be uh, filed with USCIS and the I-360 or the um, petition for that um, special immigrant juvenile status visa. Um, indicate, and it's important to indicate if an interpreter is needed um, in Spanish. And we also have um, clients that they don't speak Spanish and they speak a third language. So try to communicate ahead with court and see how you are going to do that. If you can have your own um, interpreter, because sometimes there's no, let's say for example, a Kekchi certified um, interpreter for state court. Um, you can request the hearing, the final hearing as far as um, in advance as possible. Um, even if you uh, or the service period has not run, um, but you are just request, requested, requesting, I'm sorry, that um, spot. You can send the hearing request or you must send the hearing request to the proper email addresses. And remember that you can check those email addresses online for each of the court and the judges. Always identify yourself if you're the attorney. Always identify yourself as the attorney. Um, and then if you have a staff um, helping you, we also work with um, our case workers as authorized representative for those um, children because they can file a petition on themselves um, and they work for the attorney's office. Um, communicate and follow up. If something is urgent, let the court know, as I said before. Um, and if you have to do a service by a um, publication and that is when you can't file or, or you don't know the whereabouts of a parent, either mom or dad, um, make sure that you have an attorney at Leiden in place. Um, and then um, ensure that the district clerk has pulled any returns from the OCA website and filed them. If you don't have that file, the judge cannot proceed with the final hearing. Um, here in El Paso, state court hearings now can be in person or via Zoom. The 388 383rd and 388th um, use the same link in all matters. And you can find that link in the county website or the staff, the staff uh, can send you the link. Practice, practice, practice. Um, always you um, need to be prepared and practice and prepare your client as well, especially on how to use Zoom if you are going to have a Zoom meeting. Um, setting the, the mic, the camera, um, how to use the second channel if an interpreter is needed. Um, you need to let the, know, the court know if it's going to be a con uncontested or a default hearing and prepare your witness or your client um, to answer or to lead your witness. Um, many times um, the hearings are on, on an uncontested docket. And that means that several cases are going to be here on that specific um, time or, or day. So if brevity is important. Um, so if you are ready you know, improvising, then everything is gonna um, run smoothly. If the facts of a case are difficult, you can discuss with the client um, if they are um, not feeling well talking about that because it could be traumatic for them. Um, you can ask the judge if the authorized representative um, can swear to the matters in the petition or an affidavit um, of the authorized representative um, attesting about the facts. Um, and we here at DMRS and our unaccompanied uh, minors program we do have a social services provider that 
are pretty helpful when we have this type of cases. Um, and they also go with court uh, to court with us. Ensure that you and your clients are dressed appropriately and act accordingly to where you are at. Um, no chewing gum, eating, no wearing sunglasses or hats, stank tops, strappy tops, your posture when you are seated or, or stand up. And that's it. Thank you, Natasha. Now we have a judge's perspective, and I'm happy to, uh, to have Judge Anderson on to share her experience and expertise. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to address uh, the audience in the CLE. These cases um, can be really meaningful from the judge's perspective because we are dealing with situations that are very traumatic for children. And so it really does give us an opportunity um, to do some good in the world. Um, I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the time sensitive cases, those cases that uh, come to the courts. And usually the request is that the child's about to turn 18 on Friday and they're calling the court coordinators on Monday trying to get a setting. Please uh, look at those situations and, and be cautious or be aware of the fact that you really may need to be getting into court quickly. And so coordinate and communicate with the staff to let them know that you've got some time sensitive matters. The cases absolutely must be heard and the orders must be signed before the child is 18. And so even if you get a hearing before the child turns 18, Maybe the judge is leaving the next day to go to a CLE. So just kind of be aware of those time sensitive issues because it'd be um, you know, very unfortunate if you've gone through this whole process and then you can't get your order signed before that 18th birthday. As has been mentioned previously about interpreters, um, I think there's a mistaken notion that these children are mainly coming from Mexico. As you can see from the statistics over time, predominantly we're seeing unaccompanied juveniles and youth from Guatemala and Honduras. And that may mean that their Spanish speaking is very limited. Um, chances are they didn't get much education in their home country and their indigenous language may in fact not be Spanish. So this can present all kinds of issues that need to be addressed both in the court hearing and before the court hearing. So for example, I have had situations where the interpreter asked for a minute to speak to the child just to try to determine what is their level of education, um, you know, what do they speak uh, sort of street Spanish, um, what, what do they understand? What is their maturity? Because the bottom line is we want to make sure that the record shows that the child understands the proceeding and is giving truthful answers. Uh, I've also seen situations where before court, there may be an interpreter, albeit maybe not a certified interpreter, but still an interpreter who is able to communicate in the child's native language and then the attorney can represent or the personal representative can assure the court that the child in fact understood the questions that were asked and the information that was conveyed. Again, the child's testimony, and, and I've seen this run the gamut. Um, often these children are coming from circumstances of extreme poverty, poverty that we can't even imagine. And they, um, maybe they go to education or go to school in the beginning and they start off attending school, but pretty soon the family pulls them from school and puts them to work either in the field or in some little shop because they need the income that that child can generate. And so just be sensitive to some of those cultural differences and also be sensitive to the fact that the factual patterns can really run the gamut. You may have extreme um, sexual abuse that is inflicted by a parent or a family member. And those are the kinds of things that are pretty sensitive to go through all of the litany of facts. And so there are some options that are available to the court to either have summaries or to ask the youth 
um, is your petition, are you swearing to the contents of that petition and is it true and correct? The court is still gonna need to make the findings that Dahlia uh, represented earlier, but you can save the child some embarrassment by um, coming at the, you know, defini the definitions and the uh, circumstances that you need to develop as your factual basis in a more sensitive manner. Um, some of the other things that, you know, that, that we have seen in these cases as um, DMRS has told you, they had, I think it was 35 cases in the last two years. So these are not the kind of situations that you're going to have a case every week. I mean, they're gonna be few and far between. Um, and they are not, unlike some of the representation of parents in our child protective service arena, they don't last forever. Uh, the case is usually open and closed from the state court's perspective within a pretty short period of time, say a couple of months. Often though, um, if you're expecting that you have these horrific cases of abuse, you just need to understand that sometimes it's much more subtle. I don't think it's a weaker case necessarily um, of neglect, but I think it's just a much more subtle situation where the child has been essentially um, deprived of their childhood. They're not given an education. The idea that they would have routine vaccinations is unheard of. I mean, they're lucky if they get any medical care or treatment at all. So I think from the court's perspective, you just need to be aware of and sensitive um, of some of those subtle differences that you may see um, that cross cultural lines. I do wanna leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. Um, I think essentially uh, this covers the sorts of things that I was uh, interested in talking about. Um, I do think that make sure if you don't have um, an interpreter that is certified that you let the court know that. If you wanna bring your own interpreter, um, and if they're not certified, again, I think the court's gonna be open to any aid, anything that's gonna assist in making sure the child understands what's being asked and answered and that the testimony offered is true and correct. Um, very often what I've seen is one or both of the parents are deceased or it has been an incredibly long period of time since the child has had any contact with a parent. Um, in fact, you know, typically the child has been handed over to some other relative and that's who they've been living with right before they make the journey over to the United States. So um, these situations are really uh, compelling in the sense of children being abandoned and being left to their own devices um, and not much thought is being given to their future and what can really happen to them. With that, I'm gonna pass it back over. I think Dahlia, you had the next um, slide or the next couple of minutes to chat. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Judge Anderson. Um, and there was uh, you know, one more issue that we had up here and I wonder if you could comment on it and that's, the, the technical issues, because some of these children are detained um, in an ORR shelter. And so we just wanted to make the audience aware that there might be um, some technical issues uh, with the child zooming in for that hearing. Right, um, we did talk about, let's see, we did talk about the fact that we need to make sure that the technical issues are addressed and I've seen every situation from what looks to be a child being pulled from a classroom and set up in a private area and given an iPad or some device to testify with. So I think Natasha's comments about having a dry run are a really good idea. And just to assure the child in advance that if there is a technical glitch of some kind, they should um, be assured that we're going to persist and we're going to try to get the case heard that day and it may be that they have to log off and log back on, but um, for them not to be um, concerned about the fact uh, that they may have a technical glitch. Again, sometimes these children can be a little nervous 
Uh, they're not quite sure what kind of reception they're going to get from the court and the court system. So I occasionally will joke around a little bit with them and say something like, well, you're not married, are you? And, and they laugh and say, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, I'm not married. Um, so I think anything the court can do and the lawyers can do to make the um, youth feel like, you know, their um, case is important, but it's not a test. There's not a right and a wrong answer. And so um, we need to just make the children, you know, comfortable and making sure that they have their opportunity to be heard. Judge Anderson, I just wanted, um, you know, your perspective is so um, great being that you were on the bench um, and, and hearing these cases. Um, in your perspective for your, your fellow judges, um, what do you say to them if they're kind of feeling nervous that this is perhaps the end all be all for the child? They are maybe feeling they're the ones responsible for um, giving this child uh, legal relief, the ability to stay in the United States. Can you speak specifically to what you believe your role or you understand your role to be in this process? Certainly. Um, again, this is a state court proceeding. And so it's like really any other state court proceeding. Um, we are presented a case. We're going to have the opportunity to ask questions if we need to. Uh, the facts are going to be developed, and I'm going to make a ruling based on the testimony that I hear. Uh, there is no assurance, there is no guarantee that, in fact, this person before me is going to prevail on their immigration case just because they've been successful in the state court case. I mean, clearly, it's going to assist with the SIJS situation. But there's no guarantee. And in fact, as Dahlia has uh, referred to, it's the last time I heard there was about a two year waiting period from the time of the state court order until the immigration case has actually comes up again. So there is a lot that can happen during that time. I don't view myself as this case is being used um, to to somehow give this youth an opportunity that they don't legally have the right to pursue. There are state laws and federal laws in place that allow individuals to pursue their rights, uh, both through um, immigration uh, courts and proceedings and through family law courts and proceedings. And so I think it's just uh, my job to do my job as a state judge and rule on what's before me and um, again, with no assurance that I'm going to guarantee that I'm going to have any sway over what might happen in the immigration system. Thank you, Judge. And we have some new uh, DMRS practitioners on the call today. What advice do you have for them um, when it comes to potentially a pretrial conference? Is there anything that you would like or that you would have liked to see be addressed before the final hearing with the child that could have been addressed at a pretrial conference? And how would we go about asking for that? Well, um, you can request a pretrial conference in any case. And so some of these logistic issues like language and interpreters and sensitive information, I think you could address in the pretrial setting. Um, you know, and if you're having an issue on the publication and you want to let the court know about it. So you can use the same request for hearing forms and you just ask for a pretrial and then the final. I think the only time that it's unworkable really to do a pretrial is if you're up against that time crunch. If you've got a kid that's about to turn 18, there may not be time to do a pretrial. But even if there's not, I think before the case is called and the court reporter starts in, you could address the court with some of these issues. So um, don't be afraid to um, have a conversation with the judge about what you're concerned with. Thank you, Judge. Thank you so much for your perspective, Judge Anderson, and uh, we'll continue on with the slides, but if you have any questions uh, for myself, for Natasha, or for Judge Anderson, please make sure and include them in the Q&A. We'll leave some time at the end to answer those as well. 
As Judge Anderson just mentioned, uh, the state court piece um, is only a part of a special immigrant juvenile status case. And the second step is to petition for SIJ status using a form called an I-360. And the petition is filed with the immigration agency that adjudicates uh, petitions and applications, uh, US citizenship and immigration services. So the once uh, the state court order is obtained um, and we wanna make sure that it's valid, that it includes those three judicial determinations and that it warrants consent, then we can file this petition um, with uh, file the I-360 petition with the state court order in a cover letter um, and uh, also proof of age because that is one of the requirements, uh, one of the eligibility requirements that's outlined in the regulations that the child must be under uh, 21 at the time that they file the petition. Um, that all goes to USCIS. Um, USCIS will then send an I-360 receipt notice um, and the National Benefit Center, uh, the USCIS Service Center that adjudicates all SIJ petitions um, and SIJS-based adjustment applications um, has to adjudicate that petition within 180 days. Um, that is a statutory requirement. Uh, USCIS is publishing processing times now on their website. Um, and it looks like they are not um, able to adjudicate all petitions within that 180 day um, requirement. Um, so there are some cases that might uh, be adjudicated um, you know, as soon as possible, but not within that 180 days. USCIS can request uh, additional evidence through an RFE or a request for evidence, or they could also issue a notice of intent to deny um, or NOID for short. Um, and the petitioner has um, the ability to respond um, to those requests within the deadline that's stated um, in the notice. Um, and then once, um, once that um, additional information is provided, USCIS will then issue a decision, either granting or denying a petition. And just to make clear, USCIS doesn't always send an RFE or NOID. Sometimes uh, they will adjudicate based on the information that was first provided. If uh, the SIJ petition is granted, then a decision on deferred action will also be issued. Um, this is also a change that came about within the last year. Um, as Judge Anderson mentioned, um, there is this backlog uh, or wait time before between the child receiving SIJ status and being able to get their green card. Um, and so in order to uh, protect children that are having to wait in the backlog, USCIS has started issuing deferred action um, for SIJ um, beneficiaries. And this is really uh, an important step because uh, number one, it gives them the ability to seek employment authorization. Um, and even for children that might not be old enough to work, um, it gives them a, a government issued identity document. Um, and so it is definitely important to, to, to seek that employment authorization. Uh, for those older children, then they're able to um, obtain a social security card. They're able to uh, get a driver's license or a state, um, a state identity document, um, and um, they're able to work. It also gives them protection from removal, although um, deferred action is a form of prosecutorial discretion, um, so it doesn't protect from a judge issuing an order of removal, it does protect the child from physical removal from the US. Um, and, and that deferred action is right now being granted for up to four years. Um, if there is no um, visa at that time, then it could be renewed for additional time. If for whatever reason the, the petition is denied, the, the decision can be appealed to the Administrative Appeals Office or it could um, be appealed in federal court. So there's no need to go to that Administrative Appeals body um, and instead somebody could go straight to federal court um, to contest the, the denial of a petition. So coming back to uh, Yesenia's hypo, 
um, is that now was matched with a pro bono attorney and her um, attorney helped her and her family through the SHIS process. Um, in this case, the attorney obtained a custody order. So the mother was named as the sole managing conservator um, in a default hearing because the SNS father did not respond after being served. Um, and with that um, state court order, um, Yesenia's attorney was able to file the SIJ petition with USCIS, um, and the petition was approved quickly. Um, Yesenia was granted um, deferred action at the same time, and um, her attorney plans to seek a continuance until a visa number becomes available um, when she has to go to immigration court. Um, there are some other procedural tools um, that are now available. Um, for example, um, ICE can offer prosecutorial discretion in the form of dismissing proceedings against Yesenia. Um, the judge could administratively close the case or put it on a status docket. It could also take the case off the calendar so that um, Yesenia doesn't have to keep going back to immigration court. Um, just to give an update to the judge that she doesn't have a visa number available quite yet um, and can then um, move on to that third step once, she, once uh, a visa number becomes available. And speaking of that third step, um, it is an application for lawful permanent residents using a form called the I-485. And here are the SIJS adjustment um, provisions and regulations. Uh, the adjustment statute used specifically for special immigrant juveniles um, is found at 8 USC 1255H, and it allows SIJS um, uh, beneficiaries to adjust status. Um, adjusting status means that they can seek their green card here in the U.S. instead of having to go through a consular process abroad. Um, and that is because SIJ applicants are deemed parole for purposes of the adjustment provision um, once a visa number becomes available. Um, it's also important to remember that uh, adjustment of status is discretionary, so the applicant has to merit uh, a discretionary grant. There's uh, all sorts of uh, inadmissibility grounds that could uh, be a barrier to a child seeking a green card. Inadmissibility grounds are um, grounds that may disqualify a child from getting a green card, and they range um, from health-related grounds to national security grounds. Um, the most common ones that come up for children or for young, uh, young adults um, might be uh, criminal grounds or some sort of immigration violation. Um, there are some specific inadmissibility grounds that are automatically waived uh, for children uh, that have SIJ. Um, or that can be waived using an SIJS specific waiver. Uh, the waiver is, um, is very broad and it can be used for humanitarian purposes, family unity, or when it is otherwise in the public interest. And so there's um, in the statute, it outlines which grounds are automatically waived, which grounds can be waived, um, and then other grounds that, um, that are not waived under this specific provision, but potentially could be waived under uh, different provisions of immigration law. Um, there are regulations uh, that help to explain the statute and how the agency is going to adjudicate these applications. Um, and um, it makes some, um, some things clear regarding adjustment of status, for example, that SIJ applicants are not barred from adjustment because they have an authorized employment. And it lists um, it now the regulation since it has been updated in the last year, um, you know, matches the, the statutory definition. USCIS also has a policy manual on um, SIJS adjustment. That's really helpful because it goes through all of these requirements and provisions. Um, it, a youth can seek adjustment either before USCIS or before the immigration court, depending on 
um, whether or not they're in removal proceedings. So if a child remained in removal proceedings um, because uh, ICE did not dismiss proceedings um, or because the judge did not terminate proceedings, then they would have to seek their adjustment before the immigration court. Um, of course, that means there's going to be opposing counsel represented by ICE um, and you know they might, um, if they might, for whatever reason, contest the adjustment if there's some um, negative factors in their discretionary analysis. Um, if the child's removal proceedings are uh, dismissed or terminated, or if they were never in removal proceedings, then they can seek uh, adjustment of status affirmatively before USCIS. And that means the application would likely um, be adjudicated on the papers. There's usually no interview that goes along with that. And now we have uh, some time for Q and A. Um, so we are happy to take any questions um, at this time. And then we have a few slides um, so that we can wrap up. Dalia, we do have a question coming from the Q and A box. Um, so reminding folks to go ahead and use that. We're gonna start reading out the questions. Um, this is our question um, from Metzeri Camacho. Can you speak a little on how to establish guardianship for third-party agencies, foster care nonprofits, et cetera, for a child that has no family or distant relatives to be released to? Thank you, that's a, a great question. And um, we typically do not use guardianship proceedings um, in Texas for, um, to seek an, uh, an order that includes the SIJS judicial determinations. I know that it does work differently um, in, in other states. Um, so for example, I understand that in California, guardianship is typically used for these cases and there are these third party agencies that will um, seek custody over the child or guardianship over the child. Um, that has typically not been um, a common practice in Texas. Um, and so we have typically, um, you know, ha heard cases in the custody setting um, for, for those private custody suits, um, or, you know, there could be ways um, to get a dependency determination um, through a SAPSER or through a, a declaratory judgment. Um, there might be some room. Um, I know that CPS does do, um, uh, cases as well, um, although usually it's the agency, um, CPS, the agency that takes um, custody over the child. It could also potentially be used in juvenile delinquency proceedings. Um, so just something to keep in mind um, because, you know, the um, there could be a dependency determination if the judge is also willing to make judicial determinations about parental reunification and best interest. Um, so that's just kind of uh, an overview of how, in, in different ways that we typically see SAJ cases in Texas. And Dahlia, I have a question for you. Um, many of us are hearing about what may be a possible lifting or end of Title 42, um, which has greatly impacted our southern border. Um, what is your perspective on how this potential end of uh, Title 42 will impact migrant children? That's a great question. Um, well, you know, just kind of taking a, a historical perspective, Title 42 was initially applied to unaccompanied children. So we did see um, some children that were um, expelled. Uh, from the US. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know about Title 42, um, this is a, a provision that was used uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, you know, to basically um, prevent people from entering the US uh, for public health reasons. Um, and so, you know, we've seen over the years, uh, now three years, um, that it has been used to, um, to expel uh, migrants from the border. Um, that Title 42 or the public health emergency is supposed to be lifted on May 11th. Um, and so that will no longer apply. My understanding is that most 
people at the border are not being expelled. Um, so, you know, um, perhaps there's been a slowing down of using um, Title 42 expulsions. Um, unaccompanied children have not been subject to Title 42 um, for some time. Um, it was used for the first six months of the pandemic, but then there was litigation that exempted them uh, from being expelled. Um, and so they've been allowed to enter um, since the fall of 2020. Um, you know, whether or not there's going to be, um, you know, um, repercussions for children um, with the lifting of Title 42, I think right now is unclear. I know that the government is making preparations um, for the lifting of, of the public health emergency um, upcoming in the next month. Thank you. And now I have a question uh, for Natasha. Um, so as Judge Anderson said, DMRS, um, DMRS is locally handling uh, the majority of cases of unaccompanied children in, um, in state court uh, requesting uh, when we're doing SIJ. Um, so out of the 35, we had three dismissed. So, uh, so that's rare, um, but can you explain, um, you know, why those cases may end up dismissed? Sure. Um, we have several reasons why those cases uh, may be dismissed. First could be that we haven't been able to uh, get a hearing, a final hearing, and the child turns 18. So then the judge has no longer jurisdiction or state court because it's older than 18. It could be because that child has been released or unified to a different state or city here in Texas. And we lost communication with that um, child and he's no longer available to appear even through Zoom to that hearing. So we lost communication. So that child couldn't appear and we can't we can proceed with that case. Um, also, uh, what we call like moving the case, if it's like if the case has been pending for um, six months, nine, nine months, and we are not moving the case, um, the judge also can decide to dismiss that case and we will have a hearing to explain the judge why um, the, the case is not moving along and, and what's going on. Um, and I think that uh, the the reasons why the case uh, could be dismissed, maybe the judge can um, share any other reasons why the case could be dismissed. I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, I don't think any of mine were dismissed. <laughs> Thank you, and we do, we do have another question. Um, I think this might be good for Dalia. Um, did we, question if we mentioned um, jurisdiction when a child is over the age of 18, but still in high school? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, you know, the, the requirement for USCIS is that, um, you know, the state court order come from a juvenile court. So, you know, a court that's making determinations about the care um, and or custody of a child. However, that's defined under state law. Um, and so under Texas law, a child is typically defined as somebody who's under 18. Although in the very, um, you know, specific provision of child support, it can be somebody over 18 if they are receiving child support. Um, so that is um, the one uh, sort of carve out that we have um, to seek an order after a child uh, turns 18. Um, and so if they qualify to receive a child support order, then they may be able to get the SIJ uh, judicial determinations that are required in that state court order. Um, so USCIS has uh, granted those I-360 petitions um, in those cases. There are some requirements uh, to seek, you know, child support. The court has to have personal jurisdiction over at least one of the parents. There has to be a, a parentage determination. The child has to be in high school. 
um, that is one of the requirements. So if you meet all of those requirements, then you may be able to get a state court order um, after the age of 18 uh, in Texas to qualify for special immigrant juvenile status. Thank you. And for folks who are here with us today that might be interested in working with children and maybe have not worked with children before, this question is for all of our panelists. Um, what is the main difference for you all working? Um, what, what considerations do you take working with children and how is it different than working with adults? And I'll go ahead and start with, uh, with Natasha. Um, so, I have had the opportunity to work with adults and also uh, with children. I love working with children. Um, it's different because we are working with a vulnerable population. And then sometimes they, they don't know that, let's say, if they had to leave school to work, they don't think that it's something bad or that, that could be neglect. And they think that they are going to be um, expressing themselves bad about either mom or dad, and they, they really don't feel that way. So it, it's hard. Um, also, they may have a different reliefs um, to stay in the US, um, different from um, adults. And there's certain protections for children, especially for unaccompanied children. Um, that are better um, if we want to um, work with them to to stay in the U.S. And they are so cute. Um, Judge Anderson, what's your perspective on working with children and the differences of working with children versus adults? Well. You know, again, we um, often when we're interviewing children in terms of a custody determination, um, it, you know, it's a very difficult situation, but we have at least two parents that are trying to vie for relief and get custody of a child. Um, in this situation, I mean, it breaks your heart because some of these kids, they have no parents, they have nobody. They're, they are literally been living in the streets or um, a relative and aunt or an uncle have taken them in. So I think we have no idea the hardships that these young people have faced. And of course the media doesn't do it justice in the sense of what you read or see in the, on the news about their situations is really far from uh, what you find out when you hear these cases. Um, I mean, it, it is truly amazing that they've managed to get to their borders and cross and, you know, be where they're at at this point in time. So, uh, but for the most part, they are so grateful for any opportunity that is afforded to them. Um, so it really is, it's really doing, doing God's work, as they say. Thank you, Judge. And Valia. I, um, I love working with children. I think, you know, law school doesn't really train you um, to work with um, traumatized populations, with, with children um, who might have uh, diminished capacity. So it definitely takes um, some additional um, work uh, to, to sort of get up to speed. Um, and at CELA, we've created a lot of resources on um, child-friendly practices, um, centering the child in representation, and how to work in a trauma-informed way. Um, you know, this requires holistic services because, um, you know, as attorneys, we, we focus on relief, um, but there might be other things um, going on that that really sort of prevents a child from e being able to work on their case. Um, and so it definitely takes patience, um, it takes courage, it takes um, expertise. Um, and so I, I really commend all of the attorneys 
and legal staff out there who are doing this really important work um, because it's hard, but it's it's so worthwhile because children are are forward looking. They they want to um, you know they want to achieve better things for themselves, and I think we are just one piece of that of of that puzzle for them, um, and that's really rewarding. Thank you, Valia. We have two really great questions, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump to them. Um, question for the judge. I have a case where I'm trying to get waivers signed, but the country is in such turmoil that notaries are not readily available. What do you recommend we use as alternative service? Well, I mean, obviously, it's much better if we can have a waiver because we have some assurance that the person actually is aware of the proceedings. But it may be that you've got to do publication or that you've got to do um, alternative service. But if the country's in turmoil, and many of these countries are, I have concerns about how you're going to get service done as well. Um, and so, um, you know, Dahlia may have some suggestions about it. Uh, those things are certainly publication is available. And I think the dilemma is that you may have some contact with the parent um, and they may be willing to sign the waiver. And so you can't really represent that you don't know where they are, but they also may be moving around some and so that trying to get service is going to be challenging. We definitely do see that. Um, and, you know, we have some resources on our website about um, publication um, because it's, you know, it, it's not easy. Um, it's not something that the family courts see all the time um, in their cases. Uh, so, so we have uh, a resource, a blog post, and other resources on our website to help with that process. Thank you. And this looks to be our final question. Um, in February 2023, Times Magazine released a report on migrant children who were alone and exploited. Sorry, I moved up. Um, if youth are unable to qualify for SIJS, could they qualify for other immigration relief, such as U or T visa, if they have been working? Absolutely, and it's so important to, um, you know, SIJ cases can take a long time because uh, the child is waiting for an immigrant visa number before they can seek their green card. So it's really important to keep contact with the child and rescreen for relief. Um, you know, every once in a while um, to, to check in with them, see how things are going, see whether, you know, they might be uh, the victim of exploitation at their at their job um, and see whether or not they might qualify for you um, because they were the victim of a crime or a T visa because they were victim of, of trafficking and, and seek that relief. Um, I think that's a really important part of our work as well. And now I think I'll uh, turn it over to Natasha to tell us about pro bono opportunities that might be available at DMRS. Yes, thank you, Dalia. So here at DMRS, we do have pro bono opportunities. We are willing to mentor um, an attorney that has no experience or want to um, increase or move to a different um, area of practice. Um, let's say immigration um, and it's um, licensed um, to practice law in Texas. Um, we can um, refer cases to pro bono attorneys or on a pro bono basis um, for full representation in state court, um, partial representation, state court and immigration. Um, we also are in need of attorneys at Leiden and those are the ones that um, offer or, or represent um, parents that are, how I call them, MIA. We, we don't know the whereabouts and um, services by publication, they have to be represented by an attorney at Leiden. And it couldn't be any of us working here at the MRS. And we are um, grateful 
to have the technical assistance um, from SILA, the Children Immigration Law Academy too, um, that are super helpful when we are working with pro bono and, and for our cases as well. So if you want to become um, a pro bono attorney for DMRS, you can reach out to myself. <laughs> um, um, my name is Natasha Reyes Guia, and I am the managing attorney. Um, we are located in 2400 East Yandel Drive in the central area of El Paso. Um, you can send me an email. You can call to my direct line phone number. We also have a great um, legal director, um, Imelda Maynard, that is willing to mentor um, you as well. So it's always good, um, especially here in the border, that if you can do something else, something more, um, and help the, these children, um, you are not going to regret because as um, Dalia say, they are super grateful. And it's, I, I said, it's my blessing um, working with children. So let us know and we can mentor you if you are willing to be a pro bono attorney. Thank you, Natasha. So we hope that you'll stay connected with CELA and with DMRS. Please check out our resource library at cilacademy.org. You can also join a CELA working group or stay updated on our upcoming trainings. If you're in uh, Texas, uh, please reach out to us for technical assistance on the state court portion of SIJ cases. We, we also provide technical assistance outside of Texas. On, on other issues. Thank you again to DMRS and my co-panelists, Natasha Reyes-Diaz and Judge Kathleen Anderson. And thank you also to Linda Rivas. You should see a link to the feedback and the CLE survey in the chat box. The recording to this webinar will be posted on our website soon. So please uh, go back to our website um, to look for that. If you have anybody um, that you think should watch this webinar, um, please uh, let them know about the recording. We're able to offer CLE credit for up to a year after uh, the recording of the webinar. We will also follow up with an email, including the PDF of the presentation and the survey links once again. Uh, I wanted to take one minute um, and see if Judge Anderson has any closing um, words. Um, and I thank you so much, Judge Anderson, for your time. Um, I just would encourage anyone who's interested in volunteering in this area um, because it is so rewarding and it does give you a chance to really make a difference in a child's life. So contact DMRS. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today.